Hi there, my name is Miss Townsend and I love math. Welcome to Math with Townsend. This video is for grade 9 academic students. It's video number one of a series of videos where we look at questions from previous years EQAO and we use them to practice and review important concepts. The question we're going to look at in this video is from the 2009-2010 academic EQAO and it's question number 13. As we go through this question, we'll be looking at the major topic of linear relationships, and in particular, we'll be reviewing how to work with a table of values, how to find the equation of a line and find the initial value, the concepts and definitions of direct and partial variation, and at the end of it, if you stick around, we'll talk about how to make a graph that's not just a regular XY graph. So let's look at this question. It says, what's the charge? The table below represents the linear relationship between cost and repair time at an appliance store. Determine the initial value of this relationship. Show your work. Is this relationship direct or partial variation? Justify your answer. Okay, so we know that we have a linear relationship. We're told it's linear. We don't have to check it. We know. And therefore, if it's a linear relationship, there's an awful lot of stuff we know about it. So for example, if it's a linear relationship, I could probably write it in equation form. Now, technically, I shouldn't talk about x and y because this is not x and this is not y. So therefore, I should actually be finding the c equals slope times h. Oops, that wasn't very nice. So I should be finding the c equals mh plus b equation, not y equals mx plus b because it's not x and y. And if I could find the equation, then certainly I could just look here at B because B is the initial value. It's the flat rate, it's the vertical intercept, and you know, it's the initial value. So that's one option is find the equation of the line. And that's actually the option I'm going to show you because I think it's the most useful to review, etc. cetera. Um, but there are other options you could do. For example, you could make it a graph. You could graph the points you were given, connect them with a ruler, and look to see where your initial value is. The problem with that obviously is that you want as nice a graph as you can make, um, and that takes time. And when something takes time, you have to think, is this really the best thing to do on the EQAO? The other problem with drawing the graph is that if my initial value is a fraction or a decimal, you can't tell exactly where it is on your graph. You just have to guess and that means you'll be might be off by a little bit and it's always nicer to have exact values if you can get them. So let's go ahead and find the equation of this line. So here's that table of values again just so we can look closely. So it's probably pretty automatic at this point that we look at first differences. Now of course you don't have to. We know it's a linear relationship. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what's the point of finding first differences at all? Well you'll see. So again, don't be worried about the fact that these are not constant values. Um, they're not constant values, but I still know it's a linear relationship. I was told that. Um, so there's first differences. Hmm, okay, fine. How am I going to find the equation of the line? Well, we know to find the equation, we want to start by finding slope. And when you're given a table of values, you are given points that satisfy the equation of the line. So I actually was given three points on this line. And of course, you only need two points to find the equation of a line. So I'm going to take two points, and I'm going to find the equation using these points. So let's start by finding slope. If you have two points, you can use the slope formula. So slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So 385 minus 205 and 6 minus 3, that gives us 180 over 3. Now what I want you to notice is I already knew it was 180 over 3. So I already knew what my slope formula was going to give me. So in fact if you've done first differences, you've done the slope formula, you just have to set it up with the delta y over delta x. And again, if I had used 120 over 2, I'd still get the same slope. So first differences is useful for more than just finding if it's linear or not. First differences can actually tell you slope. 
So there's the slope of this line. So C equals 60, H plus B. How do I find B? Well, again, take one of the points that you know satisfies the equation of this line and sub it in. So C is 205, H is 3. So when I sub those values in and do the math, I get an initial value of 25. And so I'm just going to finish writing the equation of the line, C equals 60 H plus 25. So there's my initial value. And, you know, because it said show your work, make sure that the person knows that I know what I've just done. And again, on the actual question, it does say write your answer here. So there's my answer, 25. Now, there is another way I could have done it other than finding the equation or graphing that we talked about. Um, and the, it's because this, this table values is set up kind of nicely to do this little trick. I know that I'm doing plus 3 and plus 180. And because it is a linear relationship, I can go backwards by 3 and backwards by 180. And it just so happens that if I go backwards by 3, I get 0 which means I'm about to find my initial value. 205 minus 180 is 25. So you could have actually found the initial value much in a much more efficient, quick way than I did, but this method isn't always going to work. So you just have to make sure that the table of values gives you the right information if you want to use this method. So there's another way. Now, is this relationship direct or partial variation? Well, make sure you know those definitions. It's partial variation. And here's why. It's because direct variation has a very specific definition, direct variation, that you need to know. Direct variation is a relationship with a starting point or initial value of zero. So if you don't have an initial value of zero, you don't have direct variation, therefore you have partial variation. So make sure you know direct variation is a relationship with an initial value of zero. You can also think of it as a line that passes through the point zero, zero, which is the origin. So visually, a line goes through the origin, it's direct variation. Um, in terms of an equation, if it has an initial value of zero, and ours obviously has an initial value of 25, so it can't be it can't be direct, therefore it's partial. Okay, so this was an EQAO question that a couple years ago was worth four marks, or it was out of level four. And hopefully you can get a level four if you see something similar. Now what I've done is I found a couple questions that are reviewing the same sort of concept. So let's see what we can do with these questions. Alex's rose shop makes it up bouquets and charges for the vase plus a cost per rose. Twelve dollars is thirty-two eighty-five. Twelve roses is thirty-two eighty-five. Twenty roses is fifty eighty-five. What does Alex's shop charge for a vase? Now, you may not understand initially how this question is the same sort of question that we just did, and that means I want you to look very carefully. You should be trained to recognize that the word per is very important. Cost per rose. This is slope. If you see the word per, you're talking about the rate of change or the cost per an item, which means you're talking about slope. And that means vase. The charge for the vase, well, it makes sense, right? When you buy a dozen roses, you only pay once for the vase. So the vase is the flat fee of this question. And of course, flat fee is just another way of saying initial value. So when the question says, what does the shop charge for a vase? It's saying, just like up here, oops, it's saying determine the initial value of the relationship. So you just had to make sure that in the question about the rows, you read the question correctly so that you knew that it was a question about determining the initial value. So let's make a table of values because that's what we had in the last question. So I'm going to say the number of roses is going to be N for number, and the cost is going to be C. 
So I know that 12 roses is $32.85. I know that 20 roses is $50.85. Now, is it a linear relationship? Well, we know that all the information we have is that they charge for the vase, and then there's a cost per rose. And our assumption has to be that these are constant values, that every vase costs the same, and that every rose costs the same. And that's the implication in the question. And certainly, if it wasn't true, they couldn't give us this question in grade 9 math. It wouldn't be possible to do. I'm just going to neat this up. It's very messy. 30. So again, we want the initial value. So let's start the same way we did last time. I have a table of values. Let's look at first differences. And again, you may be thinking, well, do we need to do this? No, but this is my favorite way of finding slope if I have a table of values. So I know now that slope is 18 over 8. Now notice, I can't do that little trick I showed you where I subtract 8. Because if I subtract 8, I'm only at 4. And that means I don't have the initial value. So I'm going to keep going using this method. And again, <clears throat> this is a question about money. So I know that I'm allowed to use decimals whenever money is involved. So each rose is $2.25. And therefore, I can tell you the cost of a vase. So therefore, the cost of a vase is $2.25 for each rose plus the vase. Sorry, the total cost. So subbing in a value that I know, like 32.85, that was for 12 roses. So calculating, doing the math, I get a value for B of $5.85. So each vase, the vase cost $5.85, and then it was $2.25 per rose after that. So make sure you can read a question and fit the question into the concepts you know, like linear relationships. So there's one more question that I found that's interesting that is similar. Mark records his car's odometer reading. He travels at approximately the same speed for the whole journey and makes only one 30-minute rest stop. When does Mark most likely make his 30-minute stop? Now, let's say you're doing this question, you have no idea what an odometer is. Well, what do you do? Look down here, and maybe this will help. The odometer reading in kilometers. Um, an odometer is the thing that tells you how far your car is driven. And even if you don't know that, even if you have no concept of what the heck's going on, I hope that you recognize that you have a table of values, and therefore, maybe finding first differences will be useful. So I know that for time, I'm always increasing by an hour. So that's you know, less interesting. So let's find the first differences over here. So I'm subtracting to figure out how I added. So this was at 87. So in that hour, he went 87 kilometers. Next one. So now he went 44 kilometers. And then he went 88 kilometers. And then he went 85 kilometers. And in that last little leg of the journey, Alex or Mark went 88 kilometers. Now look at your first differences. What you notice is that typically in an hour he goes 85, 87, 88. But this hour here, he didn't. He only went 44 which means that's probably when he made his 30 minute rest stop because he went only half the distance and therefore maybe for half the time he wasn't driving. So when does Mark likely make his 30 minute rest stop? Uh, well, it would be between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. because that's when he didn't go the regular distance. Another way of doing this question, by the way, is you could make a graph. So here I've set up the graph already with odometer reading. And I have to make this little jump mark here because I'm not starting at zero. Here's the times down here. So if I plot the points, you can see that this point here doesn't really kind of reflect the same slope. So something else happened between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. See you in the next video. Yeah.